Stanford University. All right, I think the last time we did talk about Euler-Lagrange equations, the principle of least action, and so forth. And today's lecture, let's see how far we get, is about, that's exactly what it's about. That looks like Schrodinger equation, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, not, it's not about Schrodinger equation. Today's lecture is about symmetry and conservation laws. Now, this is really the heart of classical mechanics. We're getting to the real heart of it now. Uh, the principle of least action, the Euler-Lagrange equations, and the connections between symmetry and conservation laws, as I say, really are the heart of the subject, or at least one half of the heart of the subject. The other half is the Hamiltonian formulation. Principle of least action and Lagrangians on one side, Hamiltonian description on the other side, and they're very, very closely related. I don't think we'll get to the Hamiltonian description tonight, but we're going to study the relation between symmetries and conservation laws. Conservation laws are always connected with symmetries. And that's what we want to work out tonight and explain. Now, these things are fairly mathematical, simple mathematics. They're not complicated mathematics. But you know, they're equations. They're manipulating equations. If I knew a good way to do it without the equations, I would. But I don't know a good way. And uh, more, I don't think there is a good way to do it without the equations. And I think what you're here for, for is you're tired of reading the Scientific American, which doesn't explain things. So we do it the right way, the way, uh, the way I would do it with uh, um, people who are in becoming physicists. The only difference is we will do the minimum amount, the minimum amount necessary to go on to the next thing. OK, so <clears throat> equations. The first, before we talk about equations, let's just talk about some mathematical manipulations that we do over and over and over again. We calculate things, often we calculate the variation of something when we change things by a small parameter. We imagine there's some small parameter that we want to shift things by. I'm not going to specify right now what those things are, but there is some small parameter, and proportional to that small parameter, we're going to make a shift of something. It could be the coordinates or it could be, uh, yeah, it could just be the coordinates on the xy plane of a function of x and y. And we could ask, what happens when we shift the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate, both of them by an amount, not necessarily the same amount, but both of them proportional to the same small quantity, which we'll call delta. Delta is the standard uh, small quantity. I know we've done this before, but I just want to lay it out. OK, so we have a small quantity, delta. And when we say it's a small quantity, I mean an infinitesimally small quantity, the sort of things we do over and over in calculus. And the rule about infinitesimally small quantities is they're not 0, but they're so small that the square of them is 0. In other words, you get to ignore the square of them. Strictly speaking, we should define all of this in terms of careful limits and so forth. But the bottom line is we treat delta as a number until we come to square it. We can double it. That's fine. We can multiply it by any number. Well, we can add it to itself. Well, that's doubling it. But what we don't do is square it because it's just too small. That's the rule. That's the mathematical rule for an infinitesimal quantity. All right, and for a simple function, for a simple ordinary function, the change in f, all right, when you make, so, this is the change in f, this is not delta times f. Don't read this as delta times f. This is the change in f when you sh make a small shift proportional to the quantity delta. That is always equal to the derivative of f with respect to x times delta x plus the derivative of f with respect to y times delta y. 
where delta x and delta y are small quantities proportional to this universal small quantity delta. We'll talk again as we go on what I mean by that with precision, but here's the important working equation that we'll use over and over. And as I said, we will always ignore small quantities to the second power. OK, so this will be called the first order change in f. What is the condition that a thing is minimized? The thing that they are minimized or stationary, in general stationary, the condition is that delta f is equal to 0. And that, for example, would determine the place where x and y are at a stationary point. All right, you, won't, you know all that. I'm not telling you anything new. I just want to get it out. All right, so we study the problem of suppose there is an integral of some sort. And we can take it to be an integral over a variable called t, t for time, of course, of some quantity which we called L for Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian depends, for example, on some set of coordinates, x. It could be many of them or one of them, however many. And they're time derivatives, or they're derivatives with respect to whatever it is that t is representing. And we study the problem of minimizing or making stationary this integral. The integral is taken between two points, let's call them 1 and 2, and we worked out the equations that govern the minimum or govern the stationary character. In fact, the equations just came from the, the equations of the Euler-Lagrange equations, the differential equations. And they simply come from saying, supposing this is the trajectory that's the solution, now let's vary it a little bit over here, move it up and down a little bit, and require that the first order change in the action, this is called the action, that the first order change in the action is equal to 0. That's the principle, sometimes called least action, but it should be called stationary action. And this becomes a differential equation at that point. Mm -hmm. It has two contributions. The action can change for two reasons, for, or at least two uh, contributions to the change. One of them happens because the Lagrangian, the coordinate x changes at this point when you shift it. And the other because the velocity changes. The velocity changes, of course, because the x changes. But still, the Lagrangian depends on two things. Both of them change when you change the trajectory a little bit. And so there are two contributions to the equation of motion or to the Euler-Lagrange equation at that point. I'll remind you what they are. The one coming from the change of the velocities has the form partial of L with respect to the velocity. And if the system has many coordinates, then you might want to put an i down here to indicate which coordinate you're talking about. d by dt of that. And the reason there's a d by dt is because the little change over here, really cons for when you change the velocity, really consists of two parts, going up over here and coming back down over here. The two parts, you take the difference, and that gives you d by dt of partial of L with respect to the velocity. Okay. The other contribution to the change in the action comes from shifting x. And that has the form minus simply partial of L with respect to x sub i. Oops, x sub i. This is the contribution from shifting the ith coordinate. You can shift all of the coordinates, but supposing you concentrate just on making a little change in the ith coordinate, the first coordinate, the second coordinate, the third coordinate, in other words, that little bump only involves one of the coordinates, then this is the small change, the first order change in the action, and that is equal to 0. That's the principle of stationary action. And from this, if somebody hands you a Lagrangian, you can work out the analog of Newton's equations. We've seen that. We've done it before. Uh, let me make a slight change of notation. 
I don't want to restrict ourselves to systems which are described by um, Cartesian coordinates. We've talked, again, I think we did talk about this, but nevertheless, let me go back over it. We might be talking about angles, we might be talking about any kind of coordinates, whatever. When we talk in very great generality about a system of coordinates, and it doesn't have to be for particles, any mechanical system, or any system, not only mechanical systems, all kinds of systems are described by Lagrangians. In fact, there are no systems which ultimately are not described by including waves and fields and, uh, and quantum electrodynamics and the standard model, the whole works. Incidentally, the, um, all of these systems, quantum electrodynamics, the standard model of particle physics, they all have Lagrangians. And if you write down that Lagrangian, from it you can read off all of the equations of motion of everything that there is in the system. It's a very condensed and very, um, what shall I say, simple way of codifying all of the equations of motion of a system is to write a Lagrangian. Now that being said, I will tell you that the, um, that the Lagrangian for the standard model of particle physics, with not too small a print, fills about a page. Fills about a page. It's not a small and simple thing. It's got a lot of stuff in it. It's got all the different particles in it, all the masses, all the different interactions. And it would fill pretty much a page if you really went to write it explicitly. Of course, you can write it much less of a page if you use condensed notation. In fact, you can write it with one letter, L. You might want to put a, uh, a, a thing over here called LSM, standard model. But if you actually wanted to write it out in detail, it would take about a page, maybe a little more. On the other hand, if you wanted to write out all the equations of motion for all the degrees of freedom, all the fields, the photon field, the Z boson field, the X, well, not X, uh, the W boson field, the Higgs boson, uh, the electron, the muon, blah, 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 blah. and you want to write out all the equations of motion, I think it would fill about a 100-page book, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's probably about right. So the Lagrangian, although it may not be the world's most simple-looking expression, be kind of rough to put it on a t-shirt, it's a lot better than writing all the equations of motion. All right, so everything we know about in the world is, re is described by essentially this kind of equation, slight generalization of it. Uh, but we usually, in the context of a very abstract, not abstract, but general notion of classical mechanics, we usually don't call things x's, we call them q's. Now, I don't know why they're called q. Actually, I do know why they're q. I'll tell you in a second why they're q. So the coordinates of our system are a set of Q's labeled by an index I. It could stand for the positions, the components of position of a particle or 10 particles or whatever, but just abstractly call them Q's. Now, the quantity dL by dQ dot, that's the dependence of the Lagrangian on the velocity, on the ith component of velocity, that also has a name. And that name is the momentum conjugate to Q. We're going to see in a minute why it's called momentum. But it's labeled, like all good momenta, for reasons, again, that I don't know, by P sub i. But in fact, I do know why Q sub i is called Q sub i, and it's so that you can write P's and Q's. It is. It is. Somebody at some point decided to, that P and X didn't look nice, so they said P and Q. Now mind your P's and Q's. All right, so pi is dl by dqi dot. Let's just check that and see if it makes any sense. The Lagrangian of a particle, for example, is 1 half mv squared, uh, 1 half mx dot squared, mx dot squared over 2, plus or minus, to be precise, minus some potential energy. For a simple example, the derivative of a Lagrangian with respect to the velocity is just mx dot or mv, and that, of course, is momentum. So that's where the name comes from. Uh, but it's a more general concept. 
It's a more general concept. It's the variation of the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the uh, time derivative of a coordinate. It's called, uh, the full name is the canonical momentum conjugate to the coordinate q sub i. That's a mouthful. All right. Sometimes it's just called the conjugate momentum to q sub i. That's also a mouthful, a little bit better. Or the i, or the q sub i momentum. I don't know. There's no simple, nice uh, term for it. OK, so now this equation then becomes that the time derivative of the canonical momentum is equal to the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the corresponding coordinate. And there's one of these equations for each i. An equation, if you have, if you have, uh, if you have, if you have uh, 100 uh, particles and you have 300 coordinates, 300 momenta, then it's just a list of 300 equations. Each equation being about as big as the Lagrangian itself. And so 300 pages, well, 300 uh, lines for a one-line Lagrangian to write out all of the uh, uh, individual equations. Now, let's, uh, let's consider a couple of examples and work out some conservation laws, just as some illustrations to show, I, I don't know, did we do this? I don't think we did. Did we talk about conservation laws at all? We talked about cyclic coordinates, I think. Remember that? Those are coordinates that don't appear in the Lagrangian. And if a coordinate doesn't appear in the Lagrangian, then this right-hand side would be 0 for that coordinate. And then you would have that a certain momentum is conserved. All right, so if this vanishes, then you have a conserved quantity. But the idea is much more general than just saying there's an obvious cyclic coordinate in the system that doesn't appear in the Lagrangian. And that's what we want to get at now. Um, so we have to talk about symmetry transformations and what a symmetry transformation is. But let's do an example or two first. Let's take explicitly the Lagrangian Q1 dot squared plus q2 dot squared plus over 2. This could be the kinetic energy of a particle. I've set the mass equal to 1, and I've called x by the name q. Or it could be any number of other things. It actually could stand for all sorts of other things in nature besides just the coordinates of a particle. But let's suppose they're coordinates of a particle. And then minus the potential energy. And let's make the potential energy to be a function of the difference between q1 and q2. So what does that mean? In fact, it could be a function of the magnitude of the distance, but just a function of the distance between them. If you think of q1 and q2 as the positions of particles on a line, two particles on a line, q1 and q2, this just means the potential only depends on the separation between them. That's what it means, q1 minus q2. OK, let's write down the equation of motion now. The equation of motion, the L by dq1 dot. Well, that's just, q1, uh, that's just q1 dot. In fact, let's be smarter. Let's use the uh, lower form of the equation there. And that says that p1 dot, the time derivative of p1, is equal to the derivative of the Lagrangian minus with respect to q1. The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to q1 comes entirely from the potential term. And that's equal to, let's call it v prime. v prime stands, the, the, the notation prime often simply refers to derivative with respect to the argument of the function. The argument of the function, in other words, the thing that the function depends on, is q1 minus q2. And the derivative of v with respect to q1 minus q2 is just the, der is just the, derivative, is just the derivative of the function evaluated at the same place. In other words, if v is uh, q1 minus q2 squared, then uh, v prime is twice q1 minus q2, just the ordinary derivative with respect to the thing that's inside the brackets, inside the parentheses. But what about p2 dot? What is that? How do we differentiate v with respect to q2? 
we're going to get an extra minus sign because when Q2 varies, Q1 minus Q2 varies in the opposite direction from Q1 minus Q2. When Q1 varies, Q1 minus Q2 varies in the same direction. If we have a small little additive increase, positive additive increase in Q1, then that corresponds to a positive additive increase in Q1 minus Q2. But if we have a positive additive increase to Q2, then Q1 minus Q2 decreases a little bit. All right, so, there's a, so in calculating the derivative of the potential with respect to Q2, there's an extra minus sign, which makes this plus. Uh, Don't we have these numbers? Hmm? Shouldn't the top one be equal V prime? Okay, Shouldn't the top one be equal V prime? Because when the, the top line should be equal to zero. So left this line, line should be zero? Why? The Lagrangian is not zero. No, no, no. When we said the Lagrangian, the, the form that we have at the bottom left, pi dot, yeah. is yes. minus. It's minus, I think. Yeah, it's minus. <laughs> There's a couple of minus signs come and go, right? But the way to remember it, well, OK. <laughs> yeah, it, it is minus. But the other one is plus. Same thing, v prime of q1 minus q2. So if I add them up, what do I get? I get that the time derivative of p1, I, I know I'm being pedantic, but let's do it anyway, p1 plus p2 is equal to zero. The right-hand side cancels, and we have a conservation law, the conservation law of p1 plus p2. We'll talk about it in a moment, what this conservation law has to do with symmetry, but let's just leave that on the blackboard for a moment. Okay. Let's do another one. Let's suppose that v now depends, let's put it over here. Uh, all right, let's. Let's suppose that V depends on a different combination of V1 and V2, or Q1 and Q2. Let's let it depend on the combination A, Q1, A and B are constants, any constants. A, Q1, and for variety, let's put plus B, Q2. The potential depends only on the quantity A, Q1 plus B, Q2. Well, it could be aq1 plus bq2 squared. It could be the hyperbolic cosine of aq1 plus bq2, any function of that particular combination. Then what are the equations of motion? p1 dot is equal to minus the derivative of the potential with respect to q1. All right, when I differentiate with respect to q1 now, I'm going to pull outside a factor a. Differentiating with respect to a times q gives you a times the derivative of, with respect to the argument, and that's equal to, uh, to a times, let's just call it v, of the same thing. It's not right. V prime. V prime. V prime. V prime. Thank you. V prime. What about p2 dot? That's equal to minus b times v prime of the same thing. And now, when I add them together, they don't add to zero, okay? So the total momentum is not conserved. But if I multiply the top equation by b, and I multiply the bottom equation by a, and I subtract them, I get b P1 minus, it looks like, A P2, the derivative, yeah, well, I'm going to write the derivative on the outside here, d by dt. The time derivative of B P1, oops, did I write it? B P1 plus A P2 is equal to zero. <laughs> So, in fact, there is a conservation law. It happens not to be the conservation of P1 plus P2. It has the conservation law of BP1 minus AP2. The first example is a special case of this. It's the special case that B is 1 
and A is minus 1, I think. All right, so it's a special case. What would those constants be? Hmm? What would those constants be? Oh, um, you could get constants like this. All right, I'll tell you how you could get constants like this. Let me give you an example. Supposing we had a particle, two particles. Good, it's a, it's a good question. Let, let, let's go through it. Supposing we had two particles with different masses. M, let's call it x dot squared plus uh, capital M y dot squared. X and y do not correspond now to, um, uh, to the directions of space. They correspond to the location along a line of two particles, OK? Well, I could call it x1 and x2, but then I would have to write some more indices, x and y. Just this particle is called x, and the position of this particle is called y. And let's add to that a potential energy minus v of x minus y, OK? Now let me change variables. Oops, there's something missing. What's missing? A half. Let me change variables to get rid of these m's here. I'm going to change variables or change the, direct, the definition of the coordinates. Let's call the square root of mx, let's call that q1. It's just a change of uh, how I uh, describe the first particle. Instead of calling it x, I'm going to multiply by the square root of little m and kill call it q1. It's a bizarre thing to do, but let's do it anyway. All right, same thing for 2. Square root of big M, x, uh, y, excuse me, y, equals q2. Why did I choose square root of M? Well, if by choosing square root of M here, incidentally, the same thing is true of the time derivatives. Q1 dot is square root of m x dot, q2 dot square root of, all right, what is this here? m times x dot squared is just q dot squared. All right, so this here becomes q1 dot squared over 2. What's this one? This one is q2 dot squared over 2. But now let, look at what happens to v, minus v now x, let's go back to x and y. What is x? x is q1 divided by the square root of little m. So this becomes a potential energy, which is q1 divided by the square root of little m minus q2 divided by the square root of big M. OK, this is an example where after a change of coordinates that simplifies the kinetic energy, it simplifies the kinetic energy, but it turns the potential energy into something which contains not q1 minus q2, but q1 over square root of little m minus q2 over square root of big M. Supposing I wanted to get it in the form with a plus sign in here. Supposing I wanted to get a plus sign in here, could I do it? Instead of defining q2 to be square root of m times y, put a minus sign there. Just a, a redefinition, just a redefinition. What would happen to q2 dot squared? Does that change? No, because that's the square of something. But what happens to here? That becomes plus. So you see, you can, you can, uh, you can, why you might want to do this is another question. There might be a reason why you want the kinetic terms to come out simple. If you did, the kinetic terms get rid of this factor at the cost of additional constants in the potential energy. There are all sorts of other examples, incidentally. We'll, uh, but in any case, where is it? In any case, we see that we did not really lose the conservation law. The nature of the conservation law just changed a little bit. 
Instead of P1 plus P2, it became AP1 minus, BP1 minus AP2. Okay. Um, point, of course, which we're going to derive is that these conservation laws are connected with symmetries. And we're going to figure out what those symmetries are, and we're going to have a unified discussion of how conservation laws come about. This was just an example of some conservation laws. <clears throat> and we'll work out some more. But uh, at the moment, these were just sort of ad hoc, um, arbitrary uh, equations we wrote down. And we noticed, we noticed accidentally that there were some things which were conserved. All right, that's conservation laws. That's all a conservation law is. d by dt of something is equal to 0. So, uh, you're illustrating, if I have this right, that uh, you don't have to have a cyclic coordinate. Well, there may be a hidden cyclic coordinate. There may be hidden in there some other ways of expressing uh, the, uh, the system so that there really is a cyclic coordinate. That is possible. And it's not, to, it's not to say that there's no way to write the theory so that it has a cyclic coordinate, but it was not written in a way in which there was manifestly a cyclic coordinate. So that's, I think, uh, let's just say there was no obvious cyclic coordinate. And um, whether there is a hidden cyclic coordinate, it's not important. Uh, it's better not to think about it that way. OK, so let's, uh, let's talk about now the simplest symmetry I can imagine. It's the symmetry of the Lagrangian L equals q dot squared over 2, only one q. That's it. It's, of course, just a free particle. If, if, if uh, q was called x, we would recognize it as a free particle with mass 1. But what do I mean by a symmetry? I mean by a symmetry a change that you can make in Q, a coordinate change, basically, in Q that doesn't affect the Lagrangian. Another, you can think of it in two ways. You can think of it actively or passively. You can think of it as a change, a coordinate change that changes the definition of position, or you can think of it as an actual motion. Uh, here's the two ways to think about it. Okay, here's a, and there's, there's an object, okay? If I put my center of coordinates over here, I would say that that object is at x equals 0. Well, let me move away. Let's not make it so special. It's not at x equals 0. It's at x equals something one unit or two-thirds of a unit or whatever. That's the coordinate of that object. I can change the coordinate of that object in two distinct ways, and it really doesn't matter which I do. One way is to change my coordinate system. Now that object is no longer at x equals 1. It's a, it hasn't moved. But because I've shifted my coordinate frame, the object has changed its coordinate. The other thing I can do is stay at the same place and move the object. They're really the same thing. We don't really have to distinguish them. But one is called a passive coordinate transformation. That's just moving the center of the coordinates. And the other is called active. It doesn't matter which way we're going to think about it. What we're going to think about is a change in Q Delta Q, which is just some small number. The change in Q is just going to be some small infinitesimal change. So here's our axis. In fact, to begin with, in this case, it doesn't even matter whether it's small. It doesn't even matter whether delta is small. Delta is, is a number. And this means the change in Q. And all it means is that we've either pushed the particle from wherever it was to wherever it is plus delta. Or we've changed the coordinate frame so that the coordinate of q has changed by this amount. Okay. When we do that, what happens to the change of the velocity? If we change q at every time, incidentally, when I say we change q, I mean the same shift at all times. Wherever the particle is at any time, we shift it to the right 
or we move our coordinate frame back a unit to the left uh, and change the coordinate in the same way, but always by the fixed amount delta. All right? Delta could be just the number, 0 0.001. What happens to Q dot when we do that? Nothing happens to Q dot because all we've done is add to Q a constant. In other words, we've made the change of coordinates Q prime is equal to Q plus delta or minus delta, it doesn't matter. We've changed the coordinate from Q to Q plus delta. And because delta is constant, that does not change the velocity, the time derivative. So Q dot doesn't change, Q dot squared doesn't change, and the change in the Lagrangian when you do this small operation is zero. Under this change here, the variation of the Lagrangian or the, the, uh, the, the change in the Lagrangian is equal to zero. That's a symmetry. That's what we mean by a symmetry. We mean a coordinate change, which may or may not involve a small number. In this case, it didn't matter. We could shift by a, a large amount, small amount. It doesn't matter. The change in the Lagrangian is equal to 0. That's called a symmetry. And what it means is that the Lagrangian doesn't care. The Lagrangian has the same form if we shift coordinates or if we push the particle ahead, the Lagrangian doesn't change. It's symmetric. What is the symmetry called that's associated with this kind of shift? Translation symmetry, translation of space. All right. There is, a, there is also a, um, a uh, conservation law associated with this, with this Lagrangian. At the moment, I'm not, I'm not yet arguing that it has to do with the symmetry. But we do note that there is a conservation law. And it's the cons conservation of the momentum conjugate to Q. With this Lagrangian, P dot is equal to 0. So the canonical momentum conjugate to Q is conserved. Okay. We're going to link these two things, conservation and symmetry, in a moment. But let's go to the case with two variables, q1 and q2. Where is it? Um, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Since the first example was a special case of the second, first example, we shifted both q1 and q2 together. All right. let's, let's just remind ourselves about that. In the first example, here's q1, q2. Wherever q1 and q2 are, Let's imagine shifting both of them simultaneously. I need another color. Imagine shifting both of them simultaneously, but by the same amount, delta. Delta, delta. What happens to the kinetic energies, q1 dot squared plus q2 dot squared? Nothing, because each shift, this is true for 1, and it's also true for 2. The velocities don't change at all. On the other hand, what happens to the potential energy? Here it is. The potential energy, V of Q1 minus Q2. Nothing happens because Q1 minus Q2 hasn't changed. We've moved both of them together. Q1 minus Q2, the separation between them hasn't changed. And so the potential energy also doesn't change. So here again, there is a symmetry. There is a symmetry. And there is a conservation law, the conservation law being P1 plus P2. So far, no argument that those things are connected. How about this example over here? So I will tell you what the symmetry is, and then we'll check it. We'll say Q1, my color coding is getting a little messy here. Q1 prime is Q1 plus b times, oh, that's it, plus b times delta, delta being the small number. Delta is a small number. b is not necessarily a small number. And what about q2? What should I do with q2? Anybody got a suggestion? OK, let's, plus or minus, 
In this case, minus. In this case, minus. In this case, minus. Now, first of all, b times delta and a times delta, it's, it's a bit of redundancy here. b and a are numbers. Delta is just a small quantity. Um, or for, the, for that matter, it could be any quantity, but right, think of it as small. What happens to q1 dot when you make a sh shift in q1? Nothing. You've shifted it by a constant amount. Same thing for q2. So since the velocities don't change, the kinetic part of the Lagrangian doesn't change. What about the potential? Let's see what happens to the potential. The potential is a function of a, a q1 plus b q2, right? That was the assumption. Let's see what happens to that. What happens to a q1? a q1 becomes a q1 plus a b delta. All I've done was shift q1 by amount b times delta. That had the effect of shifting a times q1 by a q1 plus a b delta. Now what about plus b plus b2 q2 plus b b q2 minus b a delta. Q2 got shifted in the opposite direction by amount a times delta. So what happens to this quantity here? It hasn't changed. These cancel. All right. So again, we found a symmetry. It's a peculiar symmetry. We don't shift the two particles by the same amount. But nevertheless, it is a symmetry of the Lagrangian, meaning a thing which doesn't change its value doesn't change the value of the Lagrangian whenever we do it. OK, the suggestion here, of course, is that symmetries are. I'm going to do one more example. One more example, which is a little more complex and a little more interesting. Uh, it doesn't have to do with translational symmetry. It has to do with rotational symmetry, rotation of axes. So let's do a rotation of axes on this blackboard. But the example you just finished, it, it would feel like the A and the B relate to masses or something, and the conserved quantity would be the center of gravity of them. It would be. It would be the center. It would be. If we transform back to the original variables, the x's, it would just be the total, the ordinary momentum. Right. It would be. But let's, uh, let's just take these equations abstractly. So far, in each case, there has been both a symmetry and a conservation law. Before I go on, I want to in introduce one more example of a symmetry, and we'll worry about later what the corresponding conservation law is. All right. Here's the symmetry. This is a system of a single particle. It could be any number of particles, but let's just do one particle moving on the xy plane. Now x and y do stand for the two directions of space. Not two particles, but the two directions of space. And the Lagrangian is m over 2 times x dot squared plus y dot squared. I'm not calling it now q's, just because I really do mean a particle moving in, uh, in Cartesian coordinates. Minus v. But I'm going to make the potential only depend on the distance from the origin. It doesn't depend on the angle. It only depends. It's called a central force or a central potential. The potential only depends on the distance. And that means that it depends on x squared plus y squared. You may complain that x squared plus y squared is the square of the distance. True enough. Uh, to depend on the square of the distance is also to depend only on the distance. So this might be our Lagrangian. V is any function. All right, now it's pretty obvious what the symmetry that I'm getting at is. It's just the symmetry which rotates the particle or rotates the position of the particle by angle theta. That will not change the distance. Nor will it change the total velocity if every 
at, if at every instant, or the total speed, I should say, the squared, the squared x dot squared plus y dot squared, but let's work it out in detail. Let's work out the equations for it. What we're interested in now is a rotation of the coordinate system. A change of coordinates that we're going to make is a change not to rotate it, not to truly rotating coordinates, but just r rotated coordinates. Words, we're not going to study it from the point of view of coordinates which are rotating, but coordinates which have been rotated by angle theta, but which are frozen. OK, what is the new coordinate x prime? The new coordinate x prime is equal to x times cosine theta plus y times sine theta. And y prime is equal to minus x sine theta plus y cosine theta. This is simply the formula for rotation of coordinates to new coordinates, x prime, x prime, and y prime. And it's very possible that I got my sine of theta wrong, but it's not important. OK, now what we're going to do now is we're going to study this for small angles. If we can prove that the Lagrangian doesn't change when we make a small change in angle, then we can also prove that it doesn't change when we make a large change in angle. And the argument is very simple. You just think of a large change in angle as a sequence of small changes in angle. We could have done the same thing over here. We could have said if the Lagrangian doesn't change when we move a thing a little bit, then we can prove that it doesn't change when we move it a lot by making a lot of little infinitesimal transformations. This is a standard procedure to study a symmetry by looking at the limit of very, very small parameter. What parameter? The angle. So in other words, we're going to go to the limit in which this angle is small, show that the Lagrangian doesn't change, but then if we can do it for one value of the small angle, we can add to that another and another and another, iterate it, iterate it, and be sure that it doesn't change when, uh, when we make a finite rotation. OK, so the question is, what is the small parameter? The small parameter is the angle. And I'm interested in keeping things only we're going to, in other words, we're going to set theta equal to delta. OK. What is the cosine of a small angle? One. One. Cosine theta. But I want to keep the correction to order delta. Is there anything I have to put here? No. Because cosine of delta, if you expand it in powers of delta, is 1 minus delta squared over 2. There is no, and plus many other terms, but there's no term proportional to delta. And remember, the rule for small infinitesimals is that delta squared is equal to 0. That's the, that's the formal rule. And so cosine of the angle is just replaced by 1. What about sine of the angle? Sine of the angle is just equal to delta. Sine of a small angle is just proportional to the angle for a very small angle. And so here's our, here's our values of cosine and sine theta. And we can plug them into here now. So let's do so. Cosine theta is just 1. And sine theta is just delta. This tells us how x, x changes. And what it tells us is that the change in x is proportional to the small quantity delta but why? It contains why. This is something new. In these other cases here, the change in coordinates was just a constant. Here, the change in the x coordinate is proportional to y. What about the change in the y coordinate? Again, cosine is 1, sine is delta. And the change in the y coordinate is minus x times delta. So we could summarize that. We could summarize that by saying that delta x is equal to y times the small parameter delta 
and delta y is equal to minus x times a small parameter. That's our infinitesimally small rotation. That's what it does to the coordinates x and y. Let's check that the Lagrangian doesn't change. Oh, incidentally, yes, let's, uh, let's do one more step. We don't need this anymore. We don't even need the drawing anymore. Here's our rule. Delta x is y times delta. Delta y is minus x times delta. I guess let's leave that there. What about the change in the x component of velocity? What is that? <coughs> All we have to do is differentiate the change in x is delta x. The change in the x component of velocity is just the time derivative of this. What is that? That's y dot times delta. And delta y dot is equal to minus x dot times delta. So the velocities do the same thing that the coordinates do. The change in the x component of velocity is proportional to the y component of velocity. The change in the y component of velocity is minus the x component of velocity times delta. All right, so this is all put all together. This is this and this are the transformations that we want to make in the Lagrangian. Let's check that the Lagrangian itself doesn't change. Let's see about the Lagrangian itself. In fact, it's not, it's not just the Lagrangian that doesn't change. Let's start with x squared plus y squared. What's the change in x squared plus y squared when we make a small change in x and y? Delta of x squared plus y squared. Change in x squared plus y squared when we make a small change in x and a small change in y. Two x delta x plus two y delta y, right? Everybody happy with that? We just differentiate this with respect to x and multiply by delta x. We differentiate this one with respect to y and multiply by delta y. That's the small change in the square of the radius. Okay? What is delta x? This is twice x. Now, delta x contains y times delta times the small parameter delta. But delta y contains minus a minus sign to two y delta delta y. So that's minus two y times delta y, which is x times delta. And these just cancel. Now, this, what, what is this saying? This had to be true. When I rotate the coordinates, it's just saying that the distance from the origin doesn't change. That's all it says. But it's a mathematical <laughs> derivation of the first order change in the radial distance, or the square of the radial distance, when you make this change. And of course, it doesn't change. So this is equal to 0. The change in x squared plus y squared, the first order change is 0. What does that mean about the change in the potential energy? It's 0. OK? What about the change in x dot squared plus y dot squared? We make exactly the same argument. Every place that you see an x and a y here, stick a dot on top of it and make exactly the same, uh, the same argument equals 0. The sums of the squares of the velocity components also don't change. So here's another example of a symmetry. And in fact, in this example, the way that I expressed it, it was not important that theta was small, but I did express it in a way that was correct for small angle. And notice the one thing that's new is that delta x and delta y actually depend on x and y. They do contain delta. They contain the small quantity delta. They're proportional to the small quantity delta. But 
the proportionality factor depends on where you are. It depends on x and y. Now we have enough to explain what a symmetry is, what a general symmetry is, and we can make a very, very, very general connection between symmetries and conserved, quantum, uh, conserved quantities. So let's define what a symmetry is. We have a bunch of Q's, Q sub i. A symmetry is a little shift, let's call it delta Q sub i, which is first of all proportional to the small quantity delta, times something which may depend on the values of the Q's themselves. In fact, let's leave that open. Let's say that depends on a function, F sub i, of what? of possibly all of the Q's. Let's write that as F sub i of Q. Every coordinate gets shifted by an amount. So let's draw a picture. Here's our system. This is Q1 and Q2. It could be a particle or it could just be some abstract set of coordinates. And wherever you are, you shift by a little amount, which is proportional to the small number delta, but which may depend on where you are. That dependence on where you are, how much you shift, is encoded in this set of functions f sub i. So it's a, it's a shift, or a coordinate transformation, which shifts things around in ways that may depend on where you are. Is this a symmetry? Is this a symmetry of the Lagrangian? Does the Lagrangian change? I don't know. But let's suppose that it is a symmetry. Let's suppose that it is a symmetry. What does that say? That says that when I change my coordinates, incidentally, we can also, uh, we can also write the change in the velocities. The change in the velocities is very simple. The change in the velocities is just equal to the time derivative of the change in the coordinates. If you want to figure out the change in the velocity of a coordinate, just differentiate the change in the coordinate. It's very straightforward. So the change in velocities is just the time derivative of the change in the corresponding coordinate. So I don't know whether some arbitrary Lagrangian that I write down, which depends on the Q's, is or is not changed when I do this. But we can write down the condition. What is the condition that the Lagrangian doesn't change? And in writing that condition down, that the Lagrangian doesn't change, we may discover something interesting about it. So let's suppose that we have some Lagrangian which depends on the Q's, which I tell you, here's some examples. I mean, we have some examples. We have some examples. I tell you that the Lagrangian does not change when I make these small changes of coordinates. And let's see what it says. Ah. Well, OK, I think we can get rid of this over here. We're going to need Lagrange's equations or the Euler-Lagrange equations. But we have another half a blackboard, so let's use it. The Lagrangian depends on what? Q and Q dot. What is the change in the Lagrangian when you change things a little bit? Sometimes I use capital, uh, sometimes I use script L. I shouldn't do that. I have I used script L? Yeah. I have, OK. Script L. L depends on Q and Q dot, or all of the Q's and all of the Q dots. So how does the Lagrangian change? It changes because each one of these changes. What's the change in the Lagrangian when I change Q sub i? It's just the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to Q sub i times delta Q sub i, right? But then we can also, oh, there's a summation. If I change all of the Q's, then the change in L is the sum. Contribution from changing each one of the coordinates. Hi.
sum of all the coordinates of the change in Lagrangian when you change the ith coordinate times the change in the ith coordinate. What's the other piece? Can you guess? No, it's the derivative. Lagrangian also depends on the q dots. So it's the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qi dot times the change in qi dot. That's all. Very straightforward. OK, but now, and that's the change in the Lagrangian. And I tell you, because I know it, that that change happens to be 0. But let's not put that down yet. Let's not put that down yet. This is the change in Lagrangian when, we're, here they are. Here are my changes and things. Delta, this is, yeah, that's fine. Is that second term? It's also in the sum. It's also in the sum, yeah. The Lagrangian changes because each one of the q sub i's changes, or, or the q sub i dots, and so that's it. OK, so now what can we do with this? Well, first of all, we can look at this and say, let's assume that the motion of the system satisfies the equations of motion, first of all. We're assuming that the system is moving according to the laws governed by the Lagrangian. Here it is, right here. So let's see what we can do with this. First of all, and we'll do this over and over again, the tricks are a very limited bag of tricks, but we do them over and over. The L by the QI dot, that's called PI. The L by the QI dot, so we could just leave it the L by the QI, but let's not. Let's call it PI times the change in qi dot. That's what's over here, summed. Now what about this one over here, dl by dqi? What is that? Well, we can read that from this equation. It's just the time derivative of pi. Well, here it is. dl by dqi is the time derivative of pi. Here's what I did. I first of all looked at this term and said, this is pi. And I just plugged it in. But then I looked at the other term in the equation, the L by dQi, and I said, hey, that's the time derivative of pi. So we get pi dot delta qi summed over i. You see anything about this? The time derivative of something times delta q plus the something times the time derivative of did I say that right? The time derivative of one thing times another plus the first thing times the time derivative of the second thing. What is that? That's the time derivative of the product. If I have a product of two things, A, B, and I want the time derivative of the product, it's just A dot B plus B dot A. Right? That's the rule for time derivatives of a product. And here, that's exactly what we have. The time derivative of P times the change in Q times p plus p times the time derivative of the change in q. And all that adds up to, very simply, is the sum over i of the time, or the time derivative. We can take the time derivative on the outside, p sub i delta q sub i. That's what we have. But what is delta q sub i? Here's delta q sub i. I'm sorry, this can't get, it doesn't get any simpler than this. It just doesn't. This is what we have to do. All right? But if you go through it a couple of times, you'll see that it really is very simple. OK, what is, what is delta q sub i? It's f sub i of q. Some function of q, which depends on where you are, these are all the q's, times the little parameter delta. So this is also equal to, d, let's just plug it in here. Delta q sub i is f sub i of q times the little parameter delta. That's the left side. That's the change in the Lagrangian due to the symmetry transformation. 
But assuming that the equations of motion are satisfied, we of course do assume the equations of motion are satisfied, and here's the parameter delta. If this change is a symmetry, what does it say about delta L? It says that it's zero. That's the meaning of a symmetry. So that says that this is equal to zero. We haven't proved that there's a symmetry. I asserted that there's a symmetry. Suppose I know there's a symmetry. Then this is what it says. Delta is a number. Delta is a small number, but it's just a number. And we can factor it out of this equation here. All right, we can just factor it out of the equation. It multiplies everything. And lo and behold, with all this magic and all this mumbo jumbo, we now have a conservation law. D by dt of something is equal to 0. And what is that something? It's something that's made up out of the velocities and the coordinates. Okay. We could give this thing a name. It's a conserved quantity, if there's a symmetry. So let's just call it quantity, capital Q. Capital Q for quantity. And what we learn is if there is a symmetry of this type here, then there is automatically, let's erase this, there is automatically a conservation law. A conservation is the conservation of summation over all the coordinates. There's a contribution to the quantity from each coordinate of the canonical momentum conjugate to that coordinate times f sub i of q, where f sub i of q is the coefficient in the small change of, of, uh, of the qth coordinate. Let's try it out. Let's do a couple of the examples that we did previously and see what we get. Yeah. Uh, just want to make sure I got the index and straight that yeah. a q inside the f sub i, uh, is, that, is, there, is there a sub there? q inside the there? f sub i. F sub i of q. When I just write f sub i of q, that means the whole set of q's. Yeah, whatever, whatever it happens, whatever they happen to be. Here's an example. Delta x is proportional to y. Delta y is proportional to minus x. So we'll, we're going to come to this example, and we're going to see what it says. We're going to come back to it. But this is of this form here, where the f's, in this case, are y and minus x. OK? Okay, so now let's go through the various examples and see what it is that's conserved. In the very first example, we had delta Q1 is equal to delta, and delta Q2 is equal to delta. What is F1 and F2? Just one. One. These Fs are just one. So what is capital Q? It's the sum over the two coordinates. I won't write summation, but we have a contribution from each coordinate, q1 and q2, of p1 times f1, but f1 is just 1, plus p2 times f2, but f2 is just 1. Momentum conservation. Momentum conservation as a consequence of translation invariance. We could have gone back to the simpler example, incidentally, with only one particle. But why bother? we we'll do it with two particles. What about the more complicated example? Where is it? Let's see. In the more complicated example, we had delta Q1 was B delta, and delta Q2 was minus A delta, I think. Is that right? I think so. And with a funny example with the asymmetry between the two coordinates. Do the same thing. What is f1 in this case? Or f, yeah, what is f1 in this case? b. What is f2? Minus a. So that means our conserved quantity is b p1 minus a p2. That's what we had before, same combination. BP1 minus AP2 is conserved. But now we see a sort of unified theme that's coming out of a deeper principle. 
the deeper principle being what we worked out here. So now that we've done that, let's do the last example. And the last example is rotations of coordinates. Let's write that one. Where is it? Here it is over here. OK. Delta x is y. Delta y is x. OK, what is fx? y. What is fy? Minus x. So now we just plug in. Q is, let's just write it, is p sub x, x and y, 1 and 2 are now being replaced by x and y, is the x component of momentum times y. That's, I shouldn't have erased this. It's summation over i of uh, p sub i, f sub i. And let's do it underneath here. All right, so it's got two terms, one for x and one for y. p, x, and f sub x is y plus p, y times f sub y, but that's minus x. Does this look familiar? Anybody know what that is? That is the angular momentum. That is the angular momentum of the particle moving around on this trajectory. I, at the moment, I'm not so much interested in angular momentum. If you don't recognize this as the angular momentum, that's OK. The important thing is it is conserved. It's a, it is a well-known quantity. It is the angular momentum of the particle xpy minus ypx, <laughs> pxy minus pyx is the angular momentum moving around in the plane. It's the problem. OK. And it's conserved. It's conserved as a consequence of asymmetry. What is that symmetry? The symmetry of rotational invariance. We could have done a much more complicated thing. We could have taken a lot of particles. Supposing there's a lot of particles, and the particles are all interacting with each other. Then is the Lagrangian invariant if we just move one particle? No. no. But what if we move them all? Yeah. yeah. So if we move them all and apply the same thing to all of them, the argument would be that there is a conserved quantity, and the conserved quantity would be the sum of all the angular momenta. Okay. So that's the deep connection between invariances or symmetry rules and conservation laws. And it is really at the heart of so much physics that uh, almost everything so I, I would stop over here and take some questions about it. And I'm willing to go over it more slowly if there were pieces that you missed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, back when you wrote the uh, delta L, yes. uh, dl dq delta q plus dl dq dot delta q dot. So if, if we had a so we drive, write if, if you want it, okay. Okay. dl might be q times delta q plus dl by dq dot, delta q dot. And I haven't bothered writing sum over i. We'll just uh, leave it that way. Here, but right. uh, so, so there's no time term in that. Would, would, you have a, would you have a time dependency then if the axes were rotating, for example? Yes. Okay. Yes, there would be more to it than uh, if the axes were rotating. Right. So that's why I said we, we're talking now for the moment about symmetries, which are symmetries where the symmetry parameters are time independent, just a fixed rotation of coordinates or a fixed translation. And uh, that's uh, right. Yes? What was the transformation? Was it Q? What was the actual transformation? Here? Yeah, well, you've transformed coordinates, right? Yes. What, what was the actual, what is the transformation? You just tell me what the functions of Q are. I mean, in the general F, is it, is it that what the Q, Q equals that sum of P sub I, F sub I? Yes. Capital Q equals. Is that, is that the transformation? No, that's the conserved quantity. Okay. No, 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 no. This Q is not a coordinate. Oh, boy. It just stands for quantity. 
Maybe we should call it CQ for conserved quantity. It is not, it's not a coordinate. It's not a transformation. No, 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 no. This is the quantity which is conserved. Okay. So here's the rule. It's in the notes, the derivation of it, and so forth. But at the end of the day, there's a rule. If that this this is the transformation over here. This tells you how each Q moves when you activate the small transformation. All right. And if the Lagrangian doesn't vary, then there's a conserved quantity, which is the sum of P sub i times F sub i. F sub i being the little, or being the coefficient of delta for that i. Yeah. So, so that transformation there would be the Fx equals y and the Fy equals That's y. That's right. That's right. For the case of rotation, this transformation over here, let's, let's clean it up a little bit. Delta x is equal to y times delta, and delta y is equal to minus x times delta. That's on this form here. Each delta q proportional to the little quantity delta, but with a function, and in one case, the function, and in this case, the, uh, the f for the variation of x is y, and the f for the variation of y is minus x. OK, that's the, uh, and this is extremely general. This is not the, it's not the, f there is, other slightly different kind of conservation laws, which we'll come to. I don't think I'll try to come to it tonight. Well, we'll see how we do. I was going to talk about conservation of energy. The, the one thing I haven't talked about in this context is conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is a little bit different. It is also associated with a symmetry. Conservation of momentum, the symmetry is translation in space. That means the lack of a dependence on where you put the origin of space. Conservation of energy is associated with the, with the invariance under time translation, which means the unimportance of where the zero of time is. We're not, I, I don't think we'll do that tonight, because I think I've probably saturated your attention span uh, I mean, I'm all hopped up on I love this stuff. I can go on for hours and hours and hours. Oh, man, this is great. But, you know, there is such a thing as attention span. And so I'm going to stop, but I'm going to field questions about it until, uh, until uh, we uh, run out of questions. Yeah. If, if, if you take a fixed coordinate system and you find the Lagrangian as, uh, as position and velocity within that, can't just the position and velocity itself be count in terms of uh, coordinate uh, transformations? For example, uh, if two particles are getting closer, you could say they're, they're, they're fixed, but the coordinates are changing. You could, you could, yeah, yeah. You could, you could. I'm not sure that would help us. We're not doing that, we're not doing that. At the moment, we're imagining a fixed set of coordinates and then a shift of the coordinates from one fixed set of coordinates to another. That's what this is about. Yeah, I understood. Right. <laughs> the fact that you might actually consider the motion of a particle to be a transformation, uh, it actually makes more sense to think of it as a transformation in the combined space of the coordinates and the momenta. Let's, I'll tell you what, let's do an example, not of conservation, but just, um, just to familiarize ourselves with Lagrangians and canonical momenta and, uh, and well, let me, let me, let me my OK, question. go ahead. Um, the reason I, it seems kind of obscure, but, but if you do it that way, then you can discuss the mechanics entirely in terms of coordinate transformation without Anything else potentially? No, no, you see, I'll tell you why. Um, the coordinate transformation that you would use if the particles started close to each other at rest, sorry, would be different than the coordinate transformation you would use if the particles started with some other motion. Uh, 
So the coordinate transformation that we would use then to follow the particles would depend on how they were moving. And we don't want to do that. We want to talk about coordinate transformations, which are just fixed coordinate transformations. And we want the coordinate transformation to be independent of the starting point, independent of the trajectory, just a fixed coordinate transformation for this purpose. For other purposes, you may want to do other things. Yeah, so let's go, let's go through in, in Lagrangian and P and Q's and all that stuff. Let's go through this, the world's simplest, or this, not quite, but the almost simplest system in physics, the harmonic oscillator. And let's just see what P and Q do as a function of time. I don't know, did we do this? I can't remember. I know we've done harmonic oscillator, but uh, not uh, in Lagrangian language. Let's do it. What's the Lagrangian for harmonic oscillator? It's kinetic energy minus potential energy. For simplicity, I'm going to set the mass of the particle equal to 1 and the spring constant also equal to 1, just for simplicity. You can work it out more generally. So the Lagrangian is q dot squared over 2, q being the coordinate of the oscillator. I've set the mass equal to 1, and I've called the coordinate q instead of x. And what about the potential energy of a harmonic oscillator? If, it was, if, it, if there was a spring constant k, then you would write k q squared. All right, so we're just going to write minus, minus because it's minus the potential energy, q squared over 2, same also over 2. All right, so that's our Lagrangian, q dot squared over 2 minus q squared over 2, and that describes a harmonic oscillator with mass equal to 1, let's say, and spring constant equal to 1. If I wanted to include the mass in the spring constant, they would just be mq dot squared and kq squared. Okay, let's work out the equations. The, the first equation, or the, uh, there's, only, there's only one equation, the L by dq dot, that's called p, and so we have dp dt is equal to dL by dq, which is minus q, right? Do I have that right? And what about dq by dt? <coughs> Sorry, let's, what about, that's not what I meant, right. What the, <laughs> The p by dt is minus q. The, that's, that's this equation over here. That's it. But there actually is another equation. It's implicit. What is the definition of p? How about p? What is p? Definition. It's the L by dq dot, right? That's q dot. That's pretty symmetric, isn't it, between P and Q? Not quite. There's a sign here, a sign here. dP by dt is equal to minus Q. dQ by dt is equal to P. P and Q, we could plot them, Q and P. Anybody know what the motion that's described here on the QP plane is? It's motion in a circle. The P dt is minus Q. The Q dt is P. That is motion in a circle. As time goes on, it simply rotates around. But these are the Lagrangian, oh, actually the, the, they are the equations of motion. And you can think of them as equations for Q and P. This tells you how Q and P change with time. And in fact, if you spend a little few minutes with it, you'll see that these are just the equations for moving around in a circle with uniform uh, angular velocity. That's not too surprising, because after all, a harmonic oscillator is an oscillator. 
And so if you look at the Q coordinate, it just oscillates back and forth as the system moves around in the QP space. What about the velocity? What about the velocity of, a, uh, of an oscillator moving back and forth? Think of it as moving back and forth. At the same time, the velocity is oscillating. When you pass through the center here, the velocity is maximum. When the oscillator passes through the center, the it's uh, maximum. So it's up here. That's the velocity, or P. When you pass in the other direction, the velocity is at the <coughs> minimum in the other direction. All right. So when you're out here, the oscillator has gotten to its maximum extension, and it stopped. It stopped dead. The velocity is zero. Over here, the velocity is zero. So. Spend a little bit of time convincing yourself that this is the motion of a circular orbit in the PQ space, in the simultaneous space of P and Q, which means velocity and position. Uh, I don't know. I can't figure it out. Never could do that. Never could tell whether it's clockwise or counter. Uh, ah, let's see. All right, here's, here's a way to tell. Um, what is P dot? Yeah, okay, well, you're probably right. What is P dot when Q is maximally positive? When Q is maximally positive, P dot is negative. Thank you. So P is moving down when Q is maximally positive. And what about, what about when Q is maximally negative? Then P dot is positive. So P is moving up here. Yep, you're right. It's clockwise, not counterclockwise. That surprises me. Why is it? I think for about 50 years I've been thinking this thing goes clockwise, counterclockwise. Hmm. What's that? Oh, that's what it is. No, that doesn't. Yeah, that, uh, that'll make a difference. That'll make a difference, yeah. Probably some point in my life I plotted it uh, with, uh, with Q. Yeah. Yeah, if you plot it this way with uh, Q up and P this way, then it goes clockwise. Thank you. Yes, I remember doing that uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> I think I've been teaching it this way for 50 years, too. <laughs> so just an observation, same system equation we have in the upper What's that? It's the same system of equations, except for the p particular special case. Now, the way that I've written them here, you may recognize as Hamilton's equations. That's fine, but we're going to get to Hamilton's equations. But uh, they are also Lagrange's equations. And uh, OK, any other questions? Yes? Using transformation, mm -hmm. is that necessary in Cartesian coordinates, or can we go to it's not necessary, but it's convenient. It's convenient. Oh, some, there are symmetries which are not of this type, where in classical mechanics, in any case, you cannot derive conservation laws. There are symmetries which don't have infinitesimal versions. Let me give you an example. Supposing I have a potential energy as a function of x or q, it doesn't matter, which looks like this. It doesn't, it's not important that it has two minima. Just, what's important about it is that it's symmetric when you flip it over. This problem has a symmetry, and the symmetry is q is replaced by minus q. It's just the flip of q. If I take q to minus q, of course, that also says that q dot goes to minus q dot. The kinetic energy doesn't change, because q dot squared doesn't change sign. And if the potential has this reflection property, then the potential also doesn't change sign when you flip q. There is no notion, in this case, of an infinitesimal transformation. It's just a flip of the blackboard 
and there's no notion of being able to, well, you, there's no notion of being able to build it up by a lot of little transformations. This type of symmetry in classical mechanics does not have a conservation law associated with it. There is one in quantum mechanics, but in classical mechanics there's no conservation law. There was no way to pull off the, uh, the little bit of magic that I did here, which was based on infinitesimal transformations. So yes, if you want to derive a symmetry, sorry, if you want to derive a conservation law from a symmetry, it should be the kind of symmetry that you can build up by little infinitesimally small motions. And in fact, all you really need is the infinitely small version of the symmetry transformation. Uh, in quantum mechanics, it's a little more interesting, this kind of transformation. But in classical mechanics, it's, um, it is less interesting and not connected with a, uh, oh, with a conservation so law. So based on what you said, is it, is it true that if capital Q is non-zero, you can't conclude that it was a non-symmetric transformation? Well, wait. Like if capital Q being non-zero, that just says the conserved quantity is non-zero. If, I think you're asking the wrong question. I think you want to know about d by dt of q, don't you? All right. If d by t t q is not equal to zero, then there was no symmetry. Or then the thing you thought was a symmetry was not a symmetry. It doesn't mean there's no symmetry, but uh, it means the thing that you thought was a symmetry that you derived, where is it, that you derived q from was not actually a symmetry. Uh, was that what you asked? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm a little <coughs> confused, and I, I might be repeating the question, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But when you say that in classical mechanics, there's no conservation principle based on reflection. Mm -hmm. But yet, it seems, I think you just showed us that the Lagrangian doesn't change. I did. But that, in that, I did indeed. But the derivation of connecting symmetries with conservation laws went through the idea of an infinitesimally small transformation. Infinitesimally small means you move things just a little bit. Here, the transformation means moving this point, this everything on this side to everything on that side. That's not a small thing to do. That's not something you can build up by um, by little incremental things. Rotations, you can build up by little incremental things. Translations, you can build up by little incremental things. Reflections, you can't. Mm -hmm. Does that have a name, that property of function? What's that? Does that property have a, of a function have a name, something that you can integrate up a differential to get something? Yeah, it's called a continuous symmetry. Continuous symmetry means exactly what I said, that you can build up all the symmetry transformations by little incremental steps, called a con continuous symmetry. This would be called a discrete symmetry. Discrete, whereas in the case where the potential was a function only of distance, then you could build up any transformation by little ones. Yeah. Yes, sir. Tell me. Why? Uh, I understand we can ignore terms uh, in delta squared or higher for a single infinitesimal one, but when you add them all up, why can you still get away with ignoring that the no. delta squares? If you <laughs> if you add up an infinite number of infinitesimals, you'll get something finite. Yeah. Right. But there's no place where we did that. There's no place where we did that. We just exa Oh, I see what you're asking. You're asking, how do I know that if I have a little infinitesimal transformation and the Lagrangian doesn't change, that if I add up a whole bunch of them, that it doesn't uh, change? OK. That's a, that's a fair question. Um, Don't you have just a finite number to add up? Well, then you never, get, you never get to any finite value of the, uh, of the parameter. Yeah, this is the theory of Lie groups, basically. This is the theory of groups of transformations. Uh, 
that, um, uh, and I, th I think, let's, let me come back to it. I don't want to, I, I don't know the answer right now. I have to think about what the answer is. Um, but the answer is that if the thing is invariant under a small transformation, that you can iterate it and, uh, and um, I don't think that I, th yeah, I, I think that general. Well, for this one, I think if you consider one small change and yeah. then uh, these uh, square terms are not trivial, yeah. then just divide that one step into two steps that are halves. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, accumulated quadratic terms of them uh, become, do become smaller. Yeah, but I think one point that's important is, for example, suppose the particle is over here, and we prove that if the particle is over here, and we shift it over to here by a small amount, that the Lagrangian doesn't change to first order. That's not enough. What you have to be able to prove is that wherever the particle is, wherever the particle is, if you shift it by the symmetry transformation, the Lagrangian doesn't change. So that then allows you to say that if it were over here and you moved it over to here, the Lagrangian doesn't change the first order. But if it were over here and you move it over to here, the Lagrangian doesn't change the first order, then it will follow that uh, the Lagrangian doesn't change. And yes, there is a point there to prove that, uh, that things don't, don't mount up. There is. Uh, I will assume it for now. Well, we should come back to it. It's a good point. Yeah. Are there phenomena in classical physics where a sudden swing, like the one you showed, I, mean, I can think of optics and reflection on a surface. Is this what? Say it again. Yeah, a transformation like this. I didn't hear what the question was. Are there interesting actual scenarios in classical physics? Are there interesting uh, scenarios? Examples. Examples in classical physics where a transformation that's a non yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. There are, there are. Um, just the harmonic oscillator is an example. The harmonic oscillator, the potential is x squared. That has the property that it, uh, that if you take x to minus x, it doesn't change. So just x squared is an example of a potential energy which has the symmetry of reflection. So the harmonic oscillator is an example, and there's no symmetry, there's no, conserva no separate conservation law associated with it. So yeah, there's lots of examples where this kind of thing happens. But harmonic oscillator is as good as any. Um, uh, forgive me for coming back to this, but I'm, it's not complete yet in my mind, mm -hmm. because uh, to use to, to, to build it up from infinitesimal yeah. um, transformations, yeah. uh, you use that differential condition as a way of stating that the Lagrangian doesn't change. Yeah. So, therefore, you, what you what you showed us, I think, is that if you build it up that way and the Lagrangian doesn't change, then you will get a conservation law. But you. Well, it was but enough. It was enough to prove the conservation right. law just to study the infinitesimal transformations. Right. Right. But that I, I, that scenario didn't speak at all to reflections that I could. No, I it didn't. That's the point. But this is another way. Of, but, but what I'm trying to say is that your differential statement is a way of stating that for that set of situations, mm -hmm. for that situation, that kind of situation, mm -hmm. Lagrangian doesn't change. <coughs> now, to just to look at reflection, you wouldn't say that way that the Lagrangian doesn't change. But you could see. The yeah, you see. That the Lagrangian mm -hmm. doesn't change. Oh, yeah. Right. You can't see it by building up. Same condition. Hmm? Isn't that an equivalent sort of condition? Which? That the Lagrangian doesn't change. In both cases, the Lagrangian doesn't change. Right. But unless you, can unless you can think of building up the symmetry by small transformations, you simply can't apply the, this, any of this logic. This logic was based on saying the first order variation in the Lagrangian was equal to 0. Okay. Here, you can't, first order doesn't mean anything. Right, first order just doesn't mean anything. So the, the whole set of equations doesn't mean anything when uh, for this uh, situation. And, right. Yes. Could you speak a bit to the history of, of 
Um, this this is a little reminds me of Emily Noether's theorem, but this, this is, is this is called Nerfus theorem. Yeah. And, and that that was in the early twentieth century, I think. Yeah. And this must have been known before. Um, and I'm, and I'm some parts of it were known. Nerthus theorem is more general, first of all. Nerthus theorem, we haven't exhausted the incomplete um, content of Nerthus theorem. But, uh, and I don't know that we ever will, but, uh, but yes, this is a, a subset of Nerthus theorem. How much of this was known before? Probably pieces of it. Uh, Oh, I'm sure pieces of it. I mean, certainly Hamilton knew pieces of it. I don't think he knew the whole story, though. So, yes. M. N. Nerther was the first one to really codify it in, uh, in a general framework. Yeah. I don't think she got tenure for it, though. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> She was not well treated. Yeah, is, is, is this still a rich field of physics? Do people still do research in classical mechanics, or is it? Yes, yes, it's certainly a rich field of. Uh, yes, it is. Um, but of course, obviously, the level that we're dealing with it has been known for a hundred years, or close to a hundred years. So. Um, uh, Let's see, when was, when was Nertha? Nertha must have been what, in the I'm not sure, 1910? I'm not sure exactly. 30, is that late? Okay, so this, well, okay, so look, a lot of this was known before, well, wait a minute. Um, much of this was known. Much of this was known. I think the general theorem that she wrote down, which is much more general than this, much more general than this, uh, probably was not known until the 1930s. I'm surprised it was that late. Um, certainly before that, the, the connection between symmetries and uh, conservation laws was certainly known well before that. But the, the great generality of it, I think, was not. And the form that she argued it in, in very elegant, beautiful, uh, general form was hers. Would you say the name? I couldn't get her name. Nertha, N-O-E-T-H-E-R. Emma, 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 Emma Nertha. As I said, pieces of it uh, were certainly known before that, yeah. Yes, sir? I'm trying to get a little bit of an intuitive connection between the, the um, transformation and the conservation. OK. I can't, give you, I can't give you a general intuition. But part of the reason you can't get an intuition for it is it's only true the connection between um, symmetry and conservation is only true in the context where the formulation of the theory is through a least action principle. Let me give you an example where there is no such connection. There is no intuitive reason why symmetry in general and conservation are the same thing. And one of the reasons that there's no general in intuition for it is it's just not true. So let me give you an example and then tell you why the example uh, look at the equation. Think of it as an equation now. Don't think of the physics of it. But it is what it is, is the equation for a, uh, ob uh, an object moving through a viscous fluid. What is it? It's x double dot, usual x double dot, times the mass is equal to minus some constant times x dot. What's this constant? This constant is the viscous drag force. Viscous drag forces are proportional to velocity. Why is it minus? Because it's a drag force. OK, so here's an equation. 
is this equation invariant under any symmetry? Yes. X goes to x plus delta. And delta doesn't even have to be small for this purpose. What happens to x dot? Delta is a constant now. What happens to x dot? It just goes to x dot. And what about x double dot? It just goes to x double dot. So this equation is invariant under a translation. Is momentum conserved? Clearly not. What does this equation say? This equation says that m times p dot, now I'm using p now just to mean mass times velocity, nothing but that. No implication that it came from a Lagrangian. Mass times the time derivative of the momentum. No, just sorry, it's just, it's just the time derivative of the momentum. Mass times velocity is momentum, and this would just be the time deriv derivative of the momentum is not zero, it's minus c times x dot, x dot would be p over m. I've used x dot, or m x dot is p. What's the solution to this equation? Exponential. p goes like e to the minus c over m t. Clearly not conserved, and yet it is, uh, it is translation invariant. What is wrong? What is wrong is that this equation never comes, cannot ever come from a principle of least action. It is not possible as a fundamental law coming from a principle of least action. It is the statistical law of an object moving through a viscous fluid constantly being bombarded by molecules such that on the statistical average, if there are many, many molecules hitting it, the force is minus the, uh, the time derivative of the... Uh... So it's a kind of um, effective description of not just the stone, but also all the, the stone moving through the water, but also all the water molecules. Uh, if we took into account everything, including the water and the stone and everything else, maybe even the earth that's... Uh, then momentum would be conserved. But nevertheless, just as an equation, just as an equation, this equation has translation invariance, but there's no conservation of momentum associated with it. Okay. So it's not the kind of fundamental equation which does come from a principle of least action. We used more than, it is not correct to say that symmetry and conservation are are uh, inevitably connected to each other. Symmetry and conservation are connected through the principle of least action, or through the principle of Lagrangian, Euler-Lagrange equations. It's only then that you can say that symmetry and, uh, and conservation are the same thing, or connected, or inevitably connected. Did that answer somebody's question? I don't know, I forgot what the question was. Uh, going back to the principle of least action, or, or more precisely, stationary action, are there yes. things that can be said about um, quantifying when it, a system can spend time at non-minimal points? You like, mean when the, min when the action is not minimum? Right. It's almost never a minimum. That's it's what almost what always some kind of saddle point. So it's a, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, almost always. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hardly ever the minimum. Uh, well, what, what about the harmonic oscillator? Wouldn't that... Uh, no, um, I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay. This is T, and this is X, okay? The harmonic oscillator, imagine that it's just sitting at the origin. If it's just, no, not even moving, just sitting at the origin, okay? Is that, and that's a possible motion. Does it correspond to least action? Okay, it certainly corresponds to a least potential energy, but the problem is that the, um, is that the Lagrangian has x dot squared. That's certainly minimum for just sitting at the origin. 
minus x, dot, minus x squared. And so the potential energy is at the maximum. If you just move it off center a little bit and leave it there for a long time and then come back, because of the x squared here, the, uh, the action decreases. It's actually a saddle point. It's a saddle point where in some directions in the, in the space, some directions in the complicated space of the trajectory, uh, it's minimum, and in other directions it's maximum. But the, but the integral over two, two points, would that be? Integral over two points. Uh, of, 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 of that x dot, of the catetical, x dot squared minus x yes. of Lagrangian. Yes. Uh, isn't, isn't the, the integral? Uh, the integral. That, yeah, well, look, that, that right, that. but just, just imagine a trajectory which spends a long, long time slightly displaced and then comes back like that. You're obviously going to, uh, since you spent a long time with this having been shifted toward the negative side, the little bit of velocity that you get for a short time over here and uh, that you get over here is not enough to overwhelm the long time that you spent with x, uh, x being shifted. So yeah, it's, it, it's almost never the principle of minimum action. It's the principle of stationary action. Yeah. And where does it come from and why is it true? The quantum mechanics. It comes from Feynman's path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, but that's not what we're doing tonight. So um, uh, it's, a, it's um, a little bit of a sad story. The principle of least action is not the principle of least action. It's the principle of stationary action, and it seems like a more complicated kind of thing. It is. Uh, so you just integrate all those possible paths like in quantum mechanics, and you pick the one that, that uh, is. That makes the action stationary. Makes the action stationary. Right. Uh, among the space of symmetries and the space of conservation laws, is it fair to say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence when it does exist? Is it invertible? Yeah, I, think, I think it's fair. Yeah, I, I can't think of any symmetry that's not connected with a conservation of the, of the continuous symmetries. Of the continuous symmetries, they're all connected with conservation laws. And of the conservation laws, I can't think of any that are not connected with symmetries. And so. the one-to-one -one and the symmetry. Yeah I, th yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, I'm a little bit hesitant because some, somebody uh, will come along with uh, some kind of funny counter example, but, uh, but you know, I, I think it's, my, uh, my colleagues like to say things like this are morally true. I don't think there's anything moral about it, but I think it's essentially true. Uh, I, can't th I can't think of any counter example, and I don't think there are any, so I, I would say yes, it's true. Strictly, not, not physically, but strictly from the mathematics. Yes. Uh, if uh, you take a sum Lagrangian, is there some theorem that says... If you take what? The some, you take some... Some Lagrangian. Then you say that's a Lagrangian. Is there a theorem that says that there has to be, there must exist a certain set of transformations that make it stationary? There's no... Th that make it stationary? Well, no, no. It's not the... Tr oh, you, you're, you're asking whether there's... You're asking whether there's always a symmetry. Right. No. No, no. <laughs> of course, I picked examples that had symmetry. Uh, <laughs> I should have given you an example of one which uh, you wouldn't find a symmetry for. Uh, right. you know, what oh, yeah. I find confusing in all this is that the difference between a transformation like a change in variables, a change in coordinates, and a change in the values of the coordinates. Okay, that's the difference. That's what I said in the beginning. It's the difference between the active and passive notion of transformations. In one notion, you actually move things. You move everything to the right. In the other notion, you keep everything fixed and you move your coordinates to the left. So we can talk about the first one. We could, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You could use either one of them. Uh, if the Lagrangian doesn't change when you move everything to the right, or, uh, and or it, 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 it'll follow that it doesn't change if you yourself move yourself to the left. I mean, is it true it, it should never change if we're just changing coordinates, just the representation? Let's say it again. The Lagrangian shouldn't change. Its value should change if we're only changing the representation. You know what I mean? It's just, we're just 
it had the particle space. Yeah, 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 space. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think in that sense, it's best to think of it as an actual change in the system. Yeah. If you think of it in terms of passive transformations, then the right words are that the form of the Lagrangian shouldn't change. But I, I think I get your point, and I think your point is right, or is, is, it makes it clearer. Think of it as active transformations. Think of it as actually moving the system, asking that the Lagrangian doesn't change if you actually move everything. And I think we'll, uh, we'll avoid uh, confusion that way, because I think that's right, yeah. Right. So good, good. Active transformations are a better way to think about it. What will next week's topic be? Hmm? What will we be talking about next week? Conservation of energy. Where does conservation of energy come from in all of this? Conservation of energy, and um, we'll uh, we'll see from there. You bring some questions, maybe some more examples. Uh, conservation of energy is clearly central and okay. and Hamilton's principles Hamilton's principles For more please visit us at stanford.edu